Hello everyone, uh, I'm Raluca Scarlett. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley in Professor Peterson's group. And I'm gonna talk about a reactor design at UC Berkeley in collaboration with ORNL and a couple of other universities. The general class um, of reactors is called FHRs, fluoride salt high temperature reactors. They're cooled by fluoride salt, but the fuel is not dissolved in the salt, so it's in, in solid form. And this fuel can have any shape. It can be pebbles or rods or plates. And the temperatures can vary and so they they form a class of reactors called FHRs. And the one that I'm going to talk about is the Pebble Bed Advanced High Temperature Reactor. This is a pool type reactor, metallic vessel, and inside of it you have a pool of coolant. Inside of it you also have graphite blocks, the moderator. So you have an internal graphite reflector and an external graphite reflector. And the coolant pathways are basically carved into these graphite blocks. Your core, where your fuel sits, is an annular core. Uh, it's filled with pebbles, uranium or thorium, or a mix. Ideally, you would have a seed region of, say, uranium or transuranics, generates neutrons that then go outwards into the blanket of thorium, and then it generates thorium out of the thorium blanket. So you might be able to notice here uh, in the annular region that you have a couple of colors, and that's showing the thorium pebbles and the, and the, the seed pebbles. Your coolant moves upwards. You have an inlet plenum at the bottom of your core, and you have an outlet plenum at the top of the core, and the coolant kind of moves in between the pebbles and up outwards, sits at the top of your core. And it's important that it sits at the top of the core because it's driven by natural circulation. And natural circulation works when you have um, a hot source at the bottom and a cold source at the top. And so you establish natural circulation just driven by gravity, no pumps, going upwards, and then you have an ultimate heat sink to air. If you lose offsite power like we had at Fukushima, um, you would still have a way to cool your reactor just by letting it sit there and establish natural circulation and extracting heat to, a to air. That's an example of one of the passive safety systems that are built into these kinds of reactors. To give another example, you may notice here that there are two vessels. So the outer vessel is called the buffer salt vessel. In case that the first, one, the first vessel breaks, the liquid in between the two vessels will keep the uh, coolant from coming out of the reactor vessel. And furthermore, even if the second one breaks, uh, there's enough inventory of coolant in the big tank at the top that it'll fill the, re the entire cavity, um, reactor cavity, so the entire room in which the reactor sits will be filled with liquid. Um, and then um, you'll have a conduction pathway from your core out to your concrete and outside. A zoom in of the core, this is the annular region where the pebbles sit. It's zoned, meaning that you have different types of pebbles in different parts of your core. Fuel is buoyant in the salt, so it, flo it floats. You put it at the bottom and then it's just going to float to the top. You, you can refuel this type of reactor online um, by just taking pebbles from the top and then the whole bed of pebbles will move up and you add more at the bottom. Um, so you have online refueling. You also have a very interesting capability. You can, ha you can um, take out your fuel and let protactinium-233 decay. Um, and um, protactinium eventually becomes a, a neutron poison, so you, you don't want it in there. Uh, so you let it decay, and then you put your fuel back in. And it, it's, it serves a similar purpose as uh, chemical re online chemical re reprocessing does in the lifter reactor. Um, so it's solid fuel, but the fact that it's, it's pebbles, uh, first of all, it gives you the, the capability of segregating different types of fuel in the same core without having to worry about walls. So there are no walls. You just put them in at the bottom, and they all kind of stay at the same radial location, and they keep that stratification. Um, and then second of all, you can, do, you can take out fuel and let it decay and then put it back into the reactor. Um, after a while. Other advantages, you have better neutron shielding of your graphite reflectors, which means longer lifetime and so on. So zooming out, FHRs combine two older technologies. The liquid fluoride salts is coolant and all their advantages. They have excellent heat transfer, they're transparent, and most importantly, they have very high uh, volumetric heat capacity. A certain volume of coolant can store a lot of energy, and that has huge impacts uh, for FHRs because it means that all the components can be much smaller. It means that you'll be pumping much less 
coolant through, through your reactor. Um, and if your components are smaller, it means that all the tests that you'll be doing to develop the components are also going to be smaller. They're going to be cheaper to build and faster to build. Of course, your reactor is going to have high thermal inertia, so it responds very slowly to transients. So you have a single phase coolant that doesn't boil until about 400, 1400 degrees Celsius, and you couple it with another already existing technology, the trisofuel. So trisofuel is a particle fuel less than one millimeter in diameter, so an oxide fuel sphere that is coated with multiple layers. And those layers behave like mini containment vessels, so they behave like mini reactors, and they contain all the fission products. They fail at temperatures of about 1600 degrees Celsius. What this means is that if you design a reactor that operates between 600 and 700 degrees Celsius, you're very far away from your fuel failure temperatures, and you're very far, far away from your coolant boiling, uh, which means you're not going to have a pressurized system, you're going to have a low pressure system, uh, which means you're not going to have thick walls, which means it's going to be cheaper for you to build that plant. Having such a large thermal margin, of course, has its enhanced safety implications. This is showing the micro containments. They sit here in the reactor cavity, and then it's surrounded by a filtered confinement, which is basically the reactor citadel where reactor equipment sits. Um, and so on. So you have multiple barriers to release of fission products. This is to illustrate the advantage of the high volumetric heat capacity of salt. So on the left side you see a 900 megawatt thermal reactor cooled by salt and on the right hand side you see a reactor half that power cooled by high pressure helium. So it's much bigger. And this is just the reactor and then you have all the components around it that would be even bigger. Other than the fuel and the coolant, there are a few other materials in the reactor. And this is very important because if you want to build something, you want those materials to be code qualified. So you have metallic components, and then you have graphite, and potentially you might have some carbon composite materials um, that act as, line, act as lining for ducts and so on. So on the metallic components, you want a metal that's not corroded by the coolant. 316 stainless steel and alloy and 800H both have an ASME Section 3 um, case. The trade-offs here are resistance to neutron radiation, corrosivity, so which generally correlates with how, which how much chromium in the alloy, because it's chromium is the first of the metals to be corroded out, out of um, the alloys by the salt. We'll see going forward uh, which one ends up being um, the best choice. To demonstrate safety of a reactor, we generally look at what are called frequency response plots. On the x-axis you have consequence and on the y-axis you have frequency. These are the regulations that bound this plot. And so how do we generate the x-axis? Well, we do analysis, we validate our analysis with experiments, convince NRC or whoever the regulator is that we have enough confidence in our, in our analysis. On the y-axis, we take a lot of components, we uh, test them in a component test facility, um, and we look at the re reliability uh, at prototypical temperatures and pressures. A development path should include all these steps. You can envision three phases. A viability phase where um, you do a set of experiments that are both what are called <coughs> integral effects tests and separate effects tests. Separate effects tests look at fundamentally um, having a better understanding of the phenomena at the base of your reactor operation. And then separate effects tests model subsystems of your reactor and they provide a validation set for your analysis. Uh, so let's say we have the passive decay heat removal system and we want to demonstrate that indeed you will extract 9 megawatt thermal out of your reactor at a given height of your system. So what you do is you build a couple of, of loops that will run as natural circulation um, and then you compare that to the analysis that you had done with your, with your numerical calculations. Uh, and so you have uh, a validation uh, of your analysis. Those are integral effects tests. And so all this would lead towards um, uh, development of a um, test reactor design. And then into the second phase, you would start looking at reliability of components. So you would need to take a pump and run in a prototypical conditions, a prototypical temperature, and with the actual salt, um, and see well, what is the failure rate. In parallel to that, it's also important to understand uh, phenomenology that uh, occurs over long periods of time. So if you have very slow corrosion rates, 
you need to un have a good understanding of that so that you can predict failure rates and reliability. Ultimately, once you have a test reactor running, potentially, um, and you've collected sufficient data to be able to submit for um, an NRC license, then you would move towards uh, building a pilot plant. It's important to have a systematic methodology for how you prioritize and identify the types of experiments and simulation and detailed design efforts. This is an example of what we do at Berkeley. We take our system and hierarchical system decomposition and you look at, well, what are the functional requirements of each of your subcomponents? Based on that, what are the priorities in terms of modeling and in terms of detailed design and in terms of uh, experiments? And this might seem like common sense, but it becomes increasingly more difficult to do as the system is more complex and it involves more disciplines and more time scales and more space scales. And it's very important to do very, very early on in the development of a new reactor concept. So we have a set of separate effects and integral effects experiments that we run at UC Berkeley. One of the big advantages with FLIB is that we can use simulant fluids. So instead of running our experiments at six to 700 degrees Celsius with fluoride salts, we can run them with an organic oil at 50 to 150 degrees Celsius. FLIB is a eutectic mixture. Dowtherm, the organic oil that's used as a simulant is also a eutectic mixture. Eutectic mixture means that the thing behaves like one when it freezes instead of two things freezing, one thing. So this is a, a great advantage and then we've run some experiments and we've shown that indeed the data from our simulant fluid matches the data from fluoride salts, forced convection heat transfer. And similarly we run simulant experiments for a pebble motion and we're building an integral effects facility which because we can use a simulant fluid and because of the advantageous properties of fly, it's very small so it covers about this is, you can see it's a scaffold, about 10 meters high. For an integral effects facility, this is very small, and it's a 100 kilowatt facility. How are you making sure that your pebbles don't get stuck, like the German PBR got uh, jammed up? Is there, what work is being done in that area? Fluoride salts are, are a lubricant for graphite. It helps in that sense. Also, the pebbles are buoyant in the, in the salt, so it, they're just gently pushed around, and we learn. <laughs> uh, I've been puzzled, but what, what is your, your fluid diode? I see that quite often, and maybe just enlighten me on what a fluid diode is in the system. It's a device that has no moving parts, and it has high flow resistance in one direction and low flow resistance in the other. So you want fluid to go in one direction and not go in the other. Uh, ideally, we want zero fluid flow in one direction, but that's not possible without moving parts. So if you look at the reactor design, during normal operation you have coolant moving up both through the core and through your decay heat removal mechanism. Now if your reactor is shut down and you, you lose your normal cooling, your coolant starts flowing downwards through the decay heat removal heat exchanger. So in one direction you want it to block the flow, in the other you want it to not block the flow. Imagine a pancake. So you flow in one direction, you flow flow just perpendicular to your pancake through the pan. Um, and then in the other case, you flow flow around the pancake. Um, so around gives you high resistance, and then through it just goes straight through. That's one image. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.